Anthony Mangmill. Congratulating the Honourable Lady for Bristol South and the Honourable Lady from uh, Thurrock for securing this debate. And I should also declare my interest because I'm the chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Preventing Sexual Violence and Conflict. I'm the co chair of the Conservative Friends of International Development. I'm an ambassador for HALO. I'm a co chair for the All Party Parliamentary Group on Conflict in Global Britain. So to say that I'm invested in this issue would perhaps be a bit of an understatement and on development matters. Um, for the purposes of this debate and for my remarks, Madam Chair, I would like to give a bit more of an international focus given that the UK has just hold, held the Preventing Sexual Violence violence in conflict conference um, and in 2012 I was a junior researcher in the then foreign secretary's office and I watched William Hague, Arminka Helich and Chloe Dalton formulate the concept around the preventing sexual violence in conflict initiative and while I'm going to say a little bit more about its creation I saw those early days as the halcyon moment of British a British uh, drive to ensure that we were leading the world in international development, tackling the issues that were so often overlooked. Because when the United Kingdom stands up on development and leads the way, so many other countries follow us. And in those early years, the UK showed its ability to create and lead new international initiatives and encourage greater global action. Whether this be in women's rights, conflict prevention, health care, or support for multilateral organisations based on the rules-based rules order, we led on them. And indeed, every summit and conference or NGO engagement, there were always British uh, diplomats and politicians sitting around the table, writing the resolutions, helping to push the international community and securing international buy-in. These are things that I think still continue and things that we need to champion in this place and within our government departments. But the creation of the Preventing Sexual Violence in Conflict initiative in 2012 was one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life. To be privy to the creation of a movement that found domestic and international support and that brought 150 countries together in unity was to behold the true diplomacy, leadership and statecraft. PSVI came about because, as so often the case, it was an overlooked issue. In every conflict and crisis zone around the world, the use of rape and sexual violence was always well documented, but the justice and support for survivors went largely ignored. Horrendous accounts have been written by countless reports and books, including Christina Lamb's book, Our Bodies, Their Battlefields, and I encourage all colleagues to read it if they haven't, which reminds us this is not a modern-day phenomenon, but a continuity through the ages of conflict. In nearly every instances of conflict, rape and sexual violence are exhibited. It is used by the perpetrators as a free tool of war. It is used to intimidate. It is used to divide. It is used to ostracize. It is used to subjugate. And for its perpetrators, it is enacted with a view of impunity. That the, in the confines of war, these atrocious acts can be committed freely and without fear of justice or consequences. For its victims, it is an act that will live with them for the rest of their lives, never forgotten, often never treated, and worst of all, never seeing justice brought to bear. The prevalence of this issue, yet the lack of international action, meant there was an opportunity to address this oversight, to engage the international community community on this important issue and that's exactly what that team did and in 2012 we set up the PSVI initiative we held the first conference in 2014 and of course this week we held our second conference albeit a few years delayed due to the pandemic we have demonstrated our ability to lead on this but we can as ever as always is the case in in this world we can go further we made significant promises madam chair in 2014 with lofty goals as the, the special envoy Angelina Josie Jolie said, she said, we knew they were lofty goals, referring to 2014, and that some progress had been made, including some prosecutions at the national level, and the adoption of the Murad Code, and the establishment of the Global Survivors Fund, but it's not nearly been enough to meet the needs of survivors to deter perpetrators from using rape as a weapon of war in almost every new conflict in the last decade. We now need to think about what we can do next, and I welcome the government's opportunity to introduce a new three-year three strategy and £12.5 million pounds of new funding and looking at how a Global Survivors Fund uh, can be uh, the continuation of funding of the Global Survivors Fund. And I might just ask the Minister if he could clarify where the, how much funding is going to be put into the Ukraine GBV fund on this point. But I would like to say that we know the political will and economic interests across the world are preventing the, the meaningful action that is needed. We now need to think what survivors need. And I'd like to just make two very quick points, Madam Chair. The first is that we need to lead the charge that more spending is put into preventing and responding to sexual and gender-based violence. To date, less than 1% of humanitarian relief is spent in this area. That funding gap is preventing the delivery of our ambitions, meaning that, that while we might identify the problems, 
we're not solving them. And second, we need to ensure there is a new international mechanism to lead on this specific issue, to specifically ensure that survivors are supported, that crimes are documented, and that justice is sought for those who have been raped. I'll leave it at there, Madam Chair, because I'm conscious of your time, but thank you. Thank you.